Our meditation today is from the most important systematizer of Protestant theology in the 16th century, John Calvin. Men will never worship God with a sincere heart or be roused to fear and obey him with sufficient zeal until they properly understand how much they are indebted to his mercy. Blessed, blessed with every blessing, holy, blameless in love, before him adopted as sons, predestined in love, even as he chose us in Christ, ere the world was. redemption through his blood we have forgiveness according to the riches of his grace even as he chose us he made known the mysteries of his will that in the fullness of the times that he might gather all things in heaven and on earth together as one in Christ. We who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory even as you when you heard the truth was sealed with the holy spirit of promise of our inheritance christ is far above every rule and power and dominion and every name that's in this age and the next. Blessed, blessed with every blessing, holy, blameless in love before him, adopted as sons, predestined in love even as he chose us in Christ ere the world was. Amen. Thank you, Lindsay. Greetings and welcome to Crescent Valley Church. My name is Adam Porcella. I am an elder here, and it is my privilege to uh, lead us in worship, at least the first part of worship today. If this is your first time at Cresham Valley Church, uh, then uh, it might be helpful for you know, to know the following four pieces of information. If this is your first time, uh, then, uh, then please do know you are welcome. If you are returning, do know you are welcome. In fact, whoever you are, you are welcome here. Second, you are invited to join us for a time of fellowship after the service. Uh, right outside here in the hallway, there's good uh, fellowship and food. Please join us for that important time of Christian uh, encouragement and fellowship. Third, we are a church that is committed to praying for one another. Our session meets, meets on a weekly basis. Uh, we pray uh, for the needs of the church, often for, uh, for you individually by name. So if you have prayer requests, please bring those to members of the session. Those, of course, will be kept in as much confidence as possible. And we do, we do pray for you. 
We also, uh, the elders are committed to making ourselves available to all of you after the church service. So if you have any specific prayer requests, please know that you will be able to find me after the church service up here. I'll be helping Jonathan put away the AV equipment, but don't let that uh, scare you away. Just uh, interrupt me and I would be happy to pray with you and uh, take your prayer requests uh, to the, the session if you would uh, like me to do that. Fourth, we are a liturgical church and a confessional church, which means that if you're lost or confused at any point during the service, uh, just follow along with the uh, church bulletin and you will be just fine. Uh, if you would, speak in that bulletin, uh, open to the, the back of that bulletin, will you will see some announcements. Please look through those announcements uh, carefully. I'm not going to touch on many of those uh, today. Uh, in fact, I really just have one thing I want to highlight, but before I do that, I would ask Jeff Hart to come on up, and uh, he has got an announcement for us. I just want to give you a quick update about Adult Sunday School. Uh, we've just concluded a quick series uh, on mercy and missions ministries that CVC is involved in, and next week and for the next uh, four weeks, we'll be doing a quick mini-series on Philemon and Jude. So if you've ever wondered what's going on with Michael disputing with the devil over the body of Moses, you'll want to come because we're going to talk about that. So come out to Adult Sunday School. Also, if you're interested in joining the Christian Ed Committee or even teaching in Adult Sunday School, I'd love to hear from you. So please talk to me or shoot me an email. I'd love to talk. Thanks. Good morning, CVC. I mentioned last week that the elders and I were working on finalizing the details of the call. The call is kind of like the job offer, if you don't know what that means. And we did. And so with a deep sense of unworthiness, but full faith in God who equips the call, I have accepted your call to be the pastor of this church. And I also want to have a few updates about where I'm going to be this month. The session has graciously allowed me to take something like a little sabbatical, a time to reflect, to prepare, to plan, one year, three year, five year, eight year plan, plan preaching for the year, but most of all, to prepare my heart to be a pastor of this church. So during the month of August, you won't see me as much as you usually do. I'll still be around some, I'll see some of you during the week. I'll be gone for two weeks in the middle of August, so you won't see me during those two weeks. I'll be with family down in Alabama. But I want you to know that I love you all. Caitlin and I love this church. It was around this time five years ago that Caitlin and I were thinking about joining this church and becoming members when John Leonard, as I was helping him redo his patio, sent me down and offered me a job as the church administrator. And so I thought, well, if they're going to pay me to come to the church, then I'll go. <laughs> and so we've been a part of Cresham ever since, and John Leonard has not let me go and has been grooming me, it seems, behind the scenes to do this very job, it seems at times, even though I've told him at times I wasn't sure if I was the right person to do that. But the Lord has called me, and I'm happy to be here, and I love you all. To that end, you should know that there's a few new hires one, you all be very happy to know that we have found a sexton, somebody who can alleviate many of us from the burden of set up and tear down. We still need at least one person, I think, to help Josiah Reimer out, who will be our sexton. So thank you, Josiah. <laughs> Greatly appreciated. I don't know where he is. Where are you? Oh, there you are. So thank you, Josiah, for helping us out. We've also hired some, a familiar name, Anna Finnegan who is going to be helping out with some higher level church admin for us uh, remotely. They're still gonna be going to their church out there, I think in Hearts, Harlotsville, Hartsville, Harlotsville. Um, but she uh, knows many of you all and is gonna be helping us out through the end of the year at least with some higher level admin. As you know, Allison Dunn has been doing an amazing job with some of the most mind numbing tasks uh, that I did not go to seminary to do and I don't enjoy doing and she's uh, very helpful. So Allison and Josiah will be here in August to help out with Set Up and Tear Down and many of the things that are going on. 
Your elders will be stepping up to make sure that church happens well and that you're well taken care of. Uh, if you need anything, reach out to any number of your wonderful elders. Thank you all. Thank you, Jonathan. A uh, lot of changes in the church, a lot to, lot to celebrate, and we will have a, a number of opportunities to celebrate Jonathan and his, his new call uh, over the next, uh, next few months. Um, but uh, I know that, that it was when, when Jonathan approached us about taking this little time away from the church, uh, the session was very much in support of that, not because we, we don't want to see Jonathan around, but we recognize that, that you have done a lot over the last nine months, uh, and uh, just know the church and the session are, are very much appreciative of all that you have, have poured into this church, so thank you. Um, one other announcement I wanted to make, it's been announced up here before, uh, we're doing some work as a church to help the Petermans uh, in their backyard. Uh, there is a, apparently a cleanup situation, I don't know the details, but it is worthy of our time and attention and support as a church, and so uh, if you have more questions about that, uh, Jonathan, you said Michelle Porcella is the person to talk to, or you, or? Michelle. All right, you or Michelle. Okay, all right, uh, leading those efforts. But uh, if you want to get outside and get some exercise, and, uh, and if you're like me, you're somebody who likes to see uh, a disaster and disorder turn into organization and cleanliness, uh, that's something very satisfying about that. So, uh, so please do uh, uh, sign up for that. Um, I think that's why they put Michelle Porcella. She's, uh, she's from the, the Dutch tradition, so cleanliness is very close to godliness. Um, please rise with me for the call to worship. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we are gathered to worship you, to give you all the honor and glory and praise that you so rightly deserve, and to learn about your word and your world. Lord, open our hearts and our minds to your will. We do live in a troubled world full of confusion and hate and fear and mistrust. Our hearts are heavy with thoughts of an ongoing war in Eastern Europe, with concerns over our country's economic stability, with national division so evident. Lord, we are a weary people at times. We're prone to worry and to doubt and to despair. Lord, help us to set aside these daily anxieties that keep us from giving you our full attention and devotion. Help us to lay these at your feet. Help us to trust in your sovereignty our hearts and our minds this morning so that through your word we can discern your will for our lives. Lord, we pray now for Dr. Ian Duguid as he preaches from the authoritative scriptures. We pray that you would give him wisdom and insight and clarity. We thank you for the incredible privilege that it is to hear your word preached in a Bible-believing church, surrounded by Christian brothers and sisters. Help us to understand and to obey, not for our glory, of course, but for your glory and for the advancement of your kingdom. Amen. If you would turn with me in your hymnals to hymn 353, hymn 353.
We have come to the time in our worship when we affirm the essential and foundational truths of our faith summarized in the Apostles' Creed. But first, I did want to share a brief thought on one important but often misunderstood phrase in the Creed. For many years, I struggled with the phrase in the Creed, he descended into hell. What does that mean? How could God enter hell? It is important to understand, though, that the Creed does not mean by the Latin phrase descendit ad inferna that Jesus went to hell if by hell we mean a place of torment. Rather, the, the creed affirms that Jesus' human soul resided in the place of the dead, and specifically the intermediate state between death and resurrection. The core belief underlying this doctrine is that Jesus genuinely experienced human death. As emphasized by the biblical authors, his human body was buried and his human soul departed to the place of the dead. This highlights the reality of Jesus' humanity and the completeness of his sacrifice for humanity's redemption. The descent to the dead is crucial for understanding the victory Christ achieved through his penal substitutionary death. His descent was not a state of suffering, but a proclamation of victory. This victory over death in Hades is emphasized in many passages, including Revelations 1.18, where Jesus declares that he now holds the keys to death in Hades. As both the completely righteous Messiah and God incarnate, he enters a realm of the dead, asserting his authority over it, and death cannot hold him. When we confess our belief that he descended into hell, we affirm the reality of Christ's humanity, the completeness of his sacrifice, and the victory he achieved over sin and death. By experiencing death on our behalf and proclaiming victory in the realm of the dead, Jesus established himself as a source of eternal life and the one who holds the keys to death and Hades, offering hope and redemption to all who believe in him. With this in mind, Christians, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated for the reading of God's word. This reading is from Psalm 130. Out of the depths I have cried to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I do hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning, yes, more than those who watch for the morning. O oh, Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is abundant redemption, and he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities.
As we just confirmed the truths of our faith together, let us also confess our sins together. After our time of corporate confession, we will uh, spend a few moments in silence confessing our sins to our Heavenly Father. Wondrous God and loving Father, robed in splendor and majesty, your mercies are new every morning and your love is unfailing. As a father has compassion on his children, so you have compassion on his. Forgive us and cleanse our hearts from sin we cannot bear, burdens we cannot carry, and regrets we cannot overcome. Restore our fellowship with you. Use us as instruments of your compassion and grace in this world as you created to be good until you make all things new through Jesus Christ. Amen. Hear the joyous promise of pardon. I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall know that I am the Lord, that you may remember and be confounded and never open your mouth again because of your shame. When I atone for you and all that you have done, declares the Lord of God. Please turn in your hymnal to hymn 128, hymn 128, and stand to sing with me, when the music begins. We practice congregational prayer. This is uh, an unusual practice in contemporary worship, but it is an ancient and important part of the liturgy in the church. Indeed, as I have mentioned before uh, from up, up here, uh, there is evidence that the church was practicing congregational prayer as early as the second century, and it has become an important and central component of the worship service in many traditions ever since.
Here at CVC, we try to keep our prayers to short one-breath prayers. We will begin, as usual, with prayers of thanksgiving. We will then turn our attention to prayers of petition. petition. And lastly, we will conclude with saying the Lord's Prayer together. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, you are most worthy of praise and adoration. Accept these prayers of your saints of thanksgiving. Father God, we thank you for CDC. We thank you for your providence and providing Jonathan as a new pastor. Lord God, we thank you for the witness of your church and the world, especially here in Philadelphia, that has so much need for the gospel and for the law. Help teach us of God. Upholding all things, Lord, we owe our very existence to you. We would be here giving thanks to you, except you have given all of us the breath of life. Thank you, Lord, that your steadfast love never ceases. Lord, indeed, there is much to be grateful for, for your steadfast love and mercy, for your hand in sustaining CVC, Lord, for how you bless each and every one of us in ways that we see and do not see. Lord, but we are also a needy people, so dependent on you, Lord. So, Lord, understanding that, please accept these prayers of petition from your people.
Almighty God, you are the great physician. So we come to you and ask boldly for the healing of those who have suffered in sickness and infirmity. Please remember especially Sarah Coleman and uh, Russell. Lord, we know that you take delight in the prayers of your children, Lord, as parents, uh, Lord, take delight in uh, our children, Lord, and so much more, Lord, as your reception of our prayer is filled with so much more grace and love than we are even capable of. Lord, we pray all these things, and we pray as you taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Would those collecting the offering please come forward. What a moment you have brought us to such a freedom we have found in you you're the healer who makes all things new I'm not going back I'm moving ahead I'm here to proclaim to you your past is over in you. All things remain new. Surrender my life to Christ. I'm moving, moving forward. You have risen. With all power in your hands, you have given me a second chance. Hallelujah, hallelujah, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I'm not going back, I'm moving ahead, I'm here to declare to you past is over in you. All things are made new. Surrender my life to Christ. I'm moving, not going back. Moving ahead. Here to declare to you my past is over in you. All things remain new. Surrender my life to Christ. I'm moving
all things new and I will follow you Please be seated. If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 1, reading from verse 12. This is God's holy, inspired, inerrant word, so let's give careful attention to the reading of it. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the Zealot, and Judas the son of James. All these, with one accord, were devoting themselves to prayer, together with the women, and Mary the mother of Jesus and his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. The company of persons was in all about 120, and said, Brothers, The scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David, concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Now this man bought a field with the reward of his wickedness, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his bowels gushed out. And it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the field was called in their own language, Akodama that is, field of blood. For it's written in the book of Psalms, may his camp become desolate and let there be no one to dwell in it, and let another take his office. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the time, a day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward two, Joseph, called Barsabbas, who was also called Justus, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them. And the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. Thus far the reading of God's Word. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank You for Your Word, and we pray that today, by Your Holy Spirit, You would open it up to us. You'd help us to understand it, how it convicts us of our sins, how it points us to the righteousness of Christ, and encourages us for our journey to our heavenly home. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Elton John was wrong. Now, I'm sure... Elton, or Sir Elton, I I should probably call him, uh, has been wrong about many things in his life. But what I have in mind particularly was that he was wrong when he wrote a song that says, sorry seems to be the hardest word. It's clear that at the time he wrote that, he did not have children. Those of you who know children know that actually sorry is remarkably easy to say, especially if you don't have to sound like you mean it. Sorry. Sorry is not the hardest word. A much harder word, especially for children, but also for the rest of us, is the word wait. Wait until your birthday, then you can open your presents. Wait until the paycheck comes in before you buy that couch. 
wait for the exams to be over, to be able to enjoy the summer. In my book, wait is a whole lot harder than sorry. But wait is exactly what Jesus told the disciples to do before he left them and ascended into heaven. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift the Father has promised. That's back in verse 4 of Acts 1. And that's exactly what they did. In today's passage, we see what they did with that time while they were waiting. They didn't spend their time playing cards or video games. They, they weren't watching TV or following the sporting exploits of the Jerusalem Jaguars. Instead, we see them in this passage doing two things that I think are models for us to copy. Praying in faith and preparing in faith. First, we see them praying in faith. We're told that the 11 apostles met together with the women, with Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers, joining constantly in prayer. And there are two aspects to the prayer I want us to see. First aspect is the consistency or the persistency of their prayer. They were constantly and persistently to be found praying together, verse 14. They didn't just meet together once in a while for a prayer meeting. They didn't just open or close their meetings with prayer. They prayed constantly. They were devoted to prayer. Now, that's a serious challenge to me personally because I don't think that's necessarily the first thing that people would say about me. Certainly, I'm constantly and persistently busy. I'm devoted to doing many things, many good things. But I'm not nearly so constantly and persistently engaged in prayer, either individually or together with other believers. And I'm convicted by this attitude of the first apostles and challenged to reorder my priorities, and perhaps some of you are also. Would it be accurate to describe this church as being constantly and persistently devoted to prayer? Certainly, that's on the agenda. And uh, perhaps this is a church that excels in that, but it's always good to be reminded, to ask the question, does our practice fit the theory? Do we really live up to our, 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 our goals there? And in order for that to, think, to happen, we may need to reorder our thinking about the church. To remind ourselves that what is really important here is what God does in this place and not what we do. What will make or break this church as an effective part of God's spiritual kingdom is not the number of small group meetings we organize or evangelistic campaigns that we run, the good deeds that we do in the community, not even the number of great sermons that are preached here. Indeed, the greatest sermons in the world will have no impact unless the Holy Spirit opens up our hearts and our minds to hear. The greatest evangelization campaign in the world has no power to convert people apart from the intervention of the Holy Spirit to bring new life into people's hearts and minds. The best-run programs to help men and women and families are of little value if they're simply an expression of our best efforts. But when God takes up our efforts, then He will accomplish everything He desires. If God is at work in our hearts and, it's, and through us in our community, then people will be changed and God will be glorified in and through this church. Now, of course, we believe that in theory. But does it actually show in the way that we operate? We say that we are desperately needy people who can do nothing without Christ, but then I, at least, often persist in acting as if I were perfectly competent by myself to accomplish anything I set my mind to. In fact, even when I feel overwhelmed by life circumstances, very often prayer is quite literally the last thing that I think to do. If I really believed that God could only accomplish His holy purposes through me and the church, 
uh, through his work, then that conviction would commit me, and I hope all of us, to far more consistent and persistent prayer. And of course, prayer is not merely a more effective way to get your to-do list done. When we fail to pray, we are acting like the spiritual orphans we often think ourselves to be, deep down in our hearts. But if we really have a loving Heavenly Father who delights to walk with us through life, to rejoice with us in moments of triumph, and to surround us with His arms in moments of pain and despair, why wouldn't we consistently and persistently run to talk with Him? But the other aspect of their prayer that Luke highlights here is the fact that they prayed with one accord, which I think is more than simply all praying in the same place at the same time. They were literally of one mind and one heart in their prayers. They didn't merely pray as individuals for their own individual needs and desires. They came together and put their minds and hearts together as well as their voices together when they prayed. They were bearing one another's burdens together before the throne of grace. And that, too, is something that we can pursue. It can happen in a variety of contexts. It just did happen in the worship service, in the congregational prayer. But it can also happen when two or three individuals meet together spontaneously for prayer. It can happen in a women's Bible study or a men's meeting or a small group or the whole church standing aside a whole day to pray for particularly pressing needs and concerns. We have a privilege as individuals and as a church to meet together and to link our hearts together regularly in prayer. And that will mark us out from our culture because we live in a very individualistic culture. And I think that's particularly true of us men. I think women more commonly work together, but, but men are encouraged in our society to model ourselves on the old Marlboro Man ads, riding tall in the individual saddle, making our own decisions, running our own life without reference to anyone else. I can show up in the church and the emphasis we put on our, having your own personal quiet time where you have your own individual me and Jesus moments. And there's certainly nothing wrong with reading the Bible and praying on your own. But we are called to be a body of believers, not a bunch of free-floating toenails and eyelashes. We're called to be interdependent. And to do that, we need to express that by meeting together to pray together in one accord. You don't need permission from anybody to do that. You don't need to wait for somebody else to organize it. Just find somebody else within the church and plan to meet with them for prayer, devotedly and unitedly. Remind one another that it is God whose work really counts, not ours. But praying wasn't the only thing the disciples did while they waited. It was very important. It was a significant part of their waiting period. But it wasn't the only item on their agenda. The other thing they did alongside praying in faith was to prepare in faith for the task ahead of them by finding another apostle to take Judas' place. Again, I think there are lessons for us to learn from this. In the first place, I think we need to learn a godly fear from the fate of Judas. You know, the name Judas for us is so intertwined with the concept of betrayal that it's hard for us to put ourselves into the shoes of the first apostles and to experience their shock at his demise. In the space of a few days, he went from being a trusted member of the inner circle, an apostle, one of those with whom they had journeyed and eaten and slept for three solid years, to a traitor who had sold the Lord for 30 pieces of silver and then died by his own hand. You know, just how shocking that whole thing must have been for the apostles can be seen in their reaction when Jesus told them shortly before the end that one of them was going to betray him. Notice, they didn't turn to one another and say, well, we all know who that's going to be. I never trusted Judas from the beginning. He's a shifty character. No, 
Well, they said, is it I, Lord? It was more believable to them that they themselves should betray Jesus than that one of the other apostles would. That's how high their confidence and trust was in each other. But nonetheless, Judas betrayed the Lord. And if Judas could do it, why not somebody else? It would be natural for the loss of Judas to have struck fear into each of their hearts. And there's a certain appropriateness in that fear. Why not me? Why wouldn't I betray the Lord? It's not because I have a more noble heart than Judas. I certainly haven't been better taught and discipled than Judas. He spent three years being schooled 24 hours a day by Jesus himself. So how can I remain confident that I would remain faithful to the end? Well, the answer is, if my confidence is in myself, I had better be very afraid. No matter what degrees I hold, what positions in the church I've occupied, what ministry I've done, none of that will keep me faithful to the Lord. Judas is merely the first of a long line of men who once were leaders in the church and then made a shipwreck of their faith. And left to myself, I too could easily abandon the faith and betray the Lord just as Judas did. And if considering the fate of Judas makes me less confident in myself, then that's certainly a good kind of fear to have. But the focus of the passage is not on reasons for fear, but on reasons for confidence. One apostle may have deserted the faith, but the other 11 are still there. Just read the list of names in verse 13. The 11 who once ran away and abandoned Jesus at the cross have now all been restored to a place of ministry. And not only are they there, but so too is Jesus' mother and his brothers. Verse 14. What's the significance of mentioning them here? Well, remember the fact that Jesus' brothers had earlier been among the skeptics. Remember that? John 7, 5. Even his brothers didn't believe in him. But now they do. The work of grace has been extended to those who formerly doubted so that they too have been brought to faith in Christ. And this, you see, is an important counter-reality to the reality of Judas abandoning his faith. The gospel that by the end of the book of Acts will go to the ends of the earth Here, first of all, is bearing fruit closer to home. In Jesus' immediate family, the people who knew him best of all, bringing hard-hearted skeptics to belief. And not only are the 11 still here, but even Judas' abandoning of his faith and betraying the Lord was itself a fulfillment of the Old Testament Scriptures. This act of wickedness and sin is not a rogue element in the world operating somehow outside God's sovereignty and control. On the contrary, this act was prophesied in the Old Testament by the Holy Spirit in the book of Psalms. Think about that. Isn't that amazing? I mean, what could be a more wickedly sinful act than to betray the Messiah and to hand him over to death? That is rebellion against the living God at its most foul and blatant. Yet even the wickedness of man in its highest and purest form could do nothing other than what God had determined from the beginning in his holy will. God is sovereign, even over the worst sin of all. And what's more, these same scriptures anticipated another man being raised up to take his place. It could never permanently be Jesus and the 11 apostles. That would have suggested that Jesus' mission had been partially unsuccessful, incomplete in at least this one point. He hadn't been able to preserve 12 apostles. No, there could no more be 11 apostles than there could be 11 tribes of Israel. The number 12 was God's plan in the beginning, and it would continue to be his plan. Another would have to be raised up to take the ministry that Judas had abandoned, as God had promised. 
And filling that place was not simply a matter of finding a volunteer or electing the most popular person. The ministry of an apostle, like all positions of leadership in Christ's church, requires someone who is qualified for that task. The qualifications of apostleship are straightforward. An apostle had to be part of Jesus' three-year training program. From the beginnings of his ministry with John the Baptist to the end of his ascension. An apostle was essentially an eyewitness of Jesus' ministry, and especially of Jesus' resurrection. And so he had to have been there all along so he could testify to what he had seen and handled and touched. That's why, by the way, we don't have apostles in the church anymore. Even then, the pool of candidates was quite restricted. There were only two suitable candidates, Joseph Barsabbas and Matthias. But now they had to choose between these two. I mean, they couldn't both be apostles, or then you'd end up with 13. That that doesn't work either. But the early church couldn't add to God's list of qualifications any more than they could take away from them. Both of these men were qualified, so which one was called to the task? I think the answer, once again, shows the early disciples' dependence upon God every step of the way. First, they prayed over the decision. They asked God, the searcher of hearts, to choose between these two equally well-qualified candidates. And then they drew lots between them, putting the decision, as it were, into God's hands. Proverbs 16, 11, the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. An apostle is not appointed by men, but by God, and so casting lots was a way to make that abundantly clear. Jesus had chosen the other apostles while here on earth, and so it's important that the risen Jesus, as it were, chose the replacement apostle. Now, having said that, is this a decision-making method that we should also regard as a model for us? Should we, too, draw lots in order to seek guidance? You know, I want to look at a new pastor, perhaps. I, I don't think that was part of the search committee process. Um, Sometimes Christians have approached circumstances as material for divination, often rather like pagans do, uh, often using Gideon's fleece. We remember that in the book of Judges, as, as you know, people talk about laying out a fleece for the Lord. It's clear they haven't closely read that narrative. Gideon is not setting a good example by laying out a fleece. G- Gideon has already been told by the angel of the Lord what he's supposed to do. He's been empowered by the Spirit of the Lord. The Lord has brought him an army, and Gideon still says, oh, please, in order for, I can really, really, really know that you want me to do this, I want to lay out a, a fleece and let it be wet on the fleece and then dry on the ground. Then when the Lord answers that, he said, yeah, yeah, but, but really, so let me lay out another fleece. And then after that, the Lord says to him, if you still doubt, here's what you should do. Go down to the Midianite camp. And Gideon does just that. So the fleece doesn't even solve Gideon's problems, and it's not a mark of his faith. It's a mark of his unbelief, and we're heading way down the road on the book of Judges. So, yeah, don't talk about laying out a fleece for the Lord. Um, it's, that's not how the Lord leads and guides us. Um, uh, we have the Spirit poured out on us. It's striking uh, that in the rest of the book of Acts, right? In Acts 6, when they need deacons, they don't say, oh, well, let's, let's draw lot, lots for the deacons. No, they, the Lord guides them to appoint these people as deacons. And 1 Timothy 3, when you're discerning the gifts that are required for eldership, there's nothing there about drawing lots. Uh, the Spirit of the Lord has not yet, at this point, been poured out on the church. That's Acts 2. And so I think that's a significant factor in the casting of lots here. And the u- uniqueness of this appointment of an, uh, a 12th apostle. So, yeah, I, I don't think that's, that's the way we proceed. That doesn't mean that God doesn't guide us through circumstances. Uh, there are situations where, where we, you know, providence seems to be pushing us in a particular uh, direction. Uh, before we were uh, planted our church uh, in England, uh, we were seeking to raise uh, finances. We didn't have a mission agency that we were going through. Uh, and so we didn't have the normal resources there, and uh, so we sent out letters to everybody we could think of, and nobody wrote back. Uh, and so after a while, my wife and I said, let's set aside a day and ask the Lord to 
guide us. Is, is this really your will for us, Lord? Because if not, we don't want to do this. But if it is, then please guide and direct us. So we set aside a day. We fasted and prayed. Middle of the day, went to pick up the mail. In the mail, there was a letter from a minister uh, in England who had just come back from a trip to the States who said, while I was in America, I met a pastor who said, do you know any British church planters working in England? Because we'd like to support somebody. And through that connection, we received half of our finances. Now, I think the Lord was guiding us through those circumstances. But of course, my reading of Providence is, yeah, that's about all it's worth, right? Uh, that doesn't bypass the, the seeking godly counsel and all the other uh, qualifications there, and of course, searching the scriptures. Providence can sometimes lead and guide us, uh, but often uh, the Lord uh, does not choose to do that. But the main point of this passage is actually not the method the apostles chose to seek God's leading. The main point is that the Lord answered their prayers. He gave his people the guidance he sought. He showed clearly his will for them in appointing a replacement apostle to take Judas's place. The number 12 was now complete. And as soon as the Holy Spirit had come, they would be ready to begin the task that had been appointed for them of bringing the gospel to the ends of the earth. And that brings us back, though, to the striking contrast that is at the heart of this passage. On the one hand, Judas, the man whose life was once so full of promise, but ended up in the shame and waste of suicide under the judgment of God. And on the other hand, Peter, the man who denied Jesus three times, yet was restored to leadership by Jesus himself, and here boldly stands up as the leader of the new community. And alongside Peter, the other 11 men, who were nobodies, humanly speaking, but whom God was empowering and who were about to turn the world upside down. What makes the difference between Judas and Peter and the other apostles? It's not that the other apostles were more gifted, more faithful, more worthy than Judas. Only the grace of God and the protecting power of the Lord Jesus preserved these apostles also from ruin. Jesus himself said in his high priestly prayer in John 17, while I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by the name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so that the scripture will be fulfilled. The Lord's protection is what made all the difference. And that protection was not going to be withdrawn now that Jesus was returning to heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, God continued to protect his apostles and to keep them safe. There were no more Judases among them. And God's grace and protecting power is similarly extended today to all those who are genuinely his people. Now, it's both good news and bad news, right? First, the bad news. Jesus' definition of, of protection doesn't match what we sometimes think it ought to. I mean, Jesus' protection of the apostles does not exclude them being beheaded, James, stoned to death, Matthias, crucified upside down, Peter. The Lord's protection is not protection from adverse circumstances. It's protection through adverse circumstances. It's the Lord's protection that enables us to remain faithful in our devotion to Him in the midst of the worst that this world can throw at us. And there should be no surprise here. Jesus Himself said, no disciple is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they'll persecute you. The Christian life is often hard, sometimes desperately hard. But God is always faithful to keep all those who are His. No one and nothing in all creation can snatch you out of his hand if you belong to him. That is good news indeed. But there's even better news in this passage. Good news for anyone who has ever felt like Judas. Because you let down the Lord. You betrayed him in thought, word, or deed. We all have. We all have betrayed Jesus. In fact, we all act like Judas every time we sin. Whenever you sin, you're following Judas in betraying our Lord by putting something else in first place in our lives 
ahead of our commitment to God. Now, it may not be 30 pieces of silver that we're selling our Lord for, but it's something far less. A momentary satisfaction of our desires. If, as I sometimes do, you feed your pride and sense of self-importance by making cutting remarks about someone else, about their appearance or their academic performance or their lack of relational skills. We betray the Lord by degrading a person who's made in His image. If you use food or shopping to medicate away your worries, you've just sold out on your faithfulness to God. If in the midst of the pressures of life you turn to internet pornography, right, you're running to another refuge apart from God. At that moment, you are saying, this feeling of power or pleasure or control or refuge is more important to me than my commitment to God. And the reality is that each of us is a Judas who sells our Savior daily for far less than 30 pieces of silver. For the affirmation of others, for a pleasurable feeling, for an emotional escape, for an erotic fantasy. We are all repeat offenders at betraying Jesus. So what's the good news? For Judas is like us. Well, that lies in the work of the Holy Spirit who brings us to repentance. See, the difference between you and Judas is not your sin or his sin. We are exactly like him in that. The difference is in your repentance, which is a work of God in our hearts delivering us from eternal death. It is God who, by His grace, makes us hate our sin and long for deliverance from it. It is God who protects those He has called His own so we're not utterly undone and destroyed by our sin, but instead learn to repent of it, to run to the cross with it, there to find the mercy and the grace that we need. See, that's what Judas was not able to do. As a result, his sin destroyed him. That's what God in His mercy and grace enables us to do. So that far from destroying us, even our sin leads us to a deeper love for God and an appreciation for His grace to us in the gospel. If God was able to preserve His first fickle and wandering apostles, He can surely preserve us as well, through His grace. You see, God is able to show you and me this grace and forgiveness because Jesus was no Judas. Jesus never betrayed His calling. In the wilderness, Jesus repeatedly refused to compromise His obedience to God's Word when He was put to the test by Satan. Jesus never took the easy way out, the path of sin that we so often choose. Jesus didn't betray his calling in the Garden of Gethsemane when he said, not my will, but yours be done. Jesus did not betray his calling. Instead, he took that faithfulness all the way to the cursed death on the cross so that rebellious and treasonous sinners like you and me could be spared from that fate. His perfect obedience to the Father stands in place of our continual rebellion as the means by which you and I have a heavenly Father and are able to enter His presence with joy. Now, if you are here today and you're not yet a believer in Christ, Judas's fate issues you with a stark challenge. How are you different from him? You too have rebelled against God in thought, word, and deed. And when you stand before God, what will be your defense? There's only one defense that endures, which is the perfect righteousness of Christ received as a free free gift through faith in Him. But if you have put your trust in Jesus Christ today, you need have no fear about your fate. No matter how weak you are, no matter how full of sin you know yourself to be, because those whom God has chosen, those whom God has called, He will also justify He will declare them righteous for the sake of Christ's righteousness in which we stand. Those He calls, He will also sanctify. Glorious thought. Transforming us slowly into the image of His Son. 
And ultimately, all those whom the Father calls, He will also glorify in His Son, giving us a wonderful inheritance that He's prepared for us along with all His saints. Only in Christ can you hope to persevere against all the assaults of Satan. Christ alone can keep you faithfully trusting Him until He comes back. And He will certainly keep you faithful if you belong to Him. Those whom Jesus holds firmly in His hands can never be snatched out of His loving grasp. They belong to Him, and they are His forever. Amen. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank You for the good news of this passage for weak, sinful people like us who so often put other things ahead of You, even after we've given ourselves to You by faith. Lord, we pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would teach us to hate our sin, to run from it. But we thank you that in the gospel, there is forgiveness for our sins. And so when we sin, teach us to run to you in repentance. Thank you that by incorporating us into Christ, you have made us different from Judas. Not because we were better than him, but because of your grace and calling us your own. Lord, that's good news, not just for us, it's good news for the rest of the world around us, both here in Philadelphia and to the ends of the earth. Lord, would you continue to spread that good news through us? Would you help us to tell our neighbors the good news of what we've heard? Would you call some from this body to go and take that good news to other parts of the world as well? And would you, by your Spirit, grant fruit to their labors and our labors? that we might see men and women and boys and girls come to faith in you and be included in your people. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing together hymn 32, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
unchanging God, hear from eternal heaven. We plead thy gifts of grace forever given. Thy call will grant repentance and new will. A sure election of thy, of thy sovereign will. Out of our faith in thee who cannot lie, out of our hearts desire goes up the cry. From hope's sweet vision of the things to be, from love to those who still are, still are loved by Thee. Bring back Thy beloved Israel, Thine own elect from whom Thy favor fell. But not from thine election, no forgive. Speak but the words, and lo, and lo, the dead shall live. Breathe upon thy church that it may greet the day. Stir her will to toil and teach and pray. Till Zion word again salvation come. And all of her outcast children, all her children are at home. Receive God's benediction. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest upon you and remain with you now and always. And to his name be the praise and the glory and the honor and the blessing forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace. <laughs>